Every Bloodborne enemy ranked from worst to best. You guys voted for it, and I'm happy to feature Bloodborne as next in line for the enemy rankings. But first, we have criteria to discuss. So here's the thing. The main reason why I started with the Sekiro enemy ranking is because I think it has the best enemies in the series. Because of the way Sekiro's combat works, you basically allow the enemies to show off their movesets so that you can deflect all of their attacks. And because of that, when ranking Sekiro's enemies, it's a lot easier to deduct that this enemy has a better moveset than that enemy. But when it comes to every other game in the series, it's a bit different. Obviously, enemies can still have well-designed attacks and poorly designed ones, but ultimately, since the main way you deal with enemies in this game is by dodging an attack and then countering, it makes it a bit harder to objectively rank their movesets. Obviously, if an enemy has prominently fun moves to dodge and are a good challenge, they'll probably make it decently high, but now things like cool designs, presentation, and even lore will be much more taken into account. So that being said, this list will be very subjective. Here's the criteria. Category 1, Moveset. Does the enemy have well-designed moves and combos? Are there any moves that are too punishing? Is the enemy worth gun parrying? And do they have any specific gimmicks to fighting them? Category 2, Presentation. Are the enemies presented in a way that makes them stand out? Are they used as a teaching tool in any capacity? Are they introduced at the appropriate moment? And does the enemy work as a tool to get across the Lovecraftian nature of the story? And Category 3, Cool Factor slash Lore. Does the enemy have a creative or memorable design, or do they have intriguing lore or an interesting backstory associated with them? Needless to say, this video will be a bit spoilery. This is your only warning. I'll admit that part of the reason lore became a focus is because I'm just a huge sucker for Bloodborne lore, and I think it presents it well through its various enemies. Though I will try my best to keep it reasonable, as sometimes there are enemies that I find really interesting, but aren't well designed gameplay-wise. Once again, it will be really subjective. Also, I know there will be enemies with cool details and lore that I miss out on, like I apologize that I'm not familiar with the deep philosophy behind the snake balls. And finally, what counts for the list. Sorry to say this, but I won't be including Chalice Dungeon exclusive enemies. I'll talk about that more at the end of the vid if you'd like to know why. Also, I'm including some enemies that are originally from boss fights, like Shadows of Yarnum or Eye Collectors, but not all of them. For example, ranking the Blood Starved Beast that returns as an enemy feels too redundant to me. Now just for the obligatory mention that some enemies will be grouped together. For example, the Chapel Giants have four different variants, but I have them all as only one spot. Okay, now that all that shit's said and done, onto the list. Number 58, Dogs. You know, the thing about dogs is, sometimes they're really not that bad. Like, if you see a single, isolated dog and you're prepared for it, you can probably get away unscathed. And while they're not as easy to handle as they are in Sekiro, these are probably still the second easiest in the series since in Bloodborne, you have a gun to just quickly knock them over. But in any type of group situation, I absolutely hate them. It's insane just how quickly they can drain your health once they actually get to you. It just always feels shitty when it happens. Nobody likes dogs in these games. I'm not the first person to mention how shit they are. Everyone just knows it. Also, I'm including all variants of dogs here. I don't care if the fish dogs look kinda cool, they're still the same to me. Number 57, Crows. Once again, these are enemies that I only really think of as being annoying, but they're one spot higher than dogs since these guys are stationary. While they're super spammy and fighting them isn't fun, at least they don't chase you down in the process. Also, it's cool how the game has one passive crow, but I still hate these things, especially since I can't help but feel like their moveset was the inspiration for Corvians in Dark Souls 3. Number 56, Rats. You know, in a game with so many creative, unique, and downright insane creature designs, it makes me feel kinda bad for the rats. There are some enemies that are more annoying than them, which people will end up talking about, but by the end of their playthrough they probably just forgot that the rats existed, which is why they're down here. I don't really have anything against them, and there are certainly more annoying enemies, but I just have the least to say about them. They just have pretty basic moves that aren't too threatening, and they die in a few hits. Farewell rats, time to forget you exist again. Number 55, Rotted Corpses. Just like the rats, I'm sure many people forgot these things even existed. I have almost nothing to say about them, they're just slow and have the world's most basic moveset, but at least they drop blood vials and bullets, and they're not super annoying or anything. Number 54, Hateful Maggots. And the best thing about these guys is easily their name. Like, why are they hateful? What are they so mad about? Anyway, similar to the rats and rotted corpses, their moveset is pretty much nothing. Like, if you die to one of these things, it's gonna feel bad and it actually isn't super unlikely since they inflict frenzy on you. So if you have a lot of insight, then perhaps these things could actually be deadly. And I guess it's memorable how they pop out of lore and silver beasts when killed, so there's that. But, yep, 
Not much else to say. Number 53, Blood Lickers. Right now I guess I'm just going back and forth between enemies that are either devoid of detail or just annoying. And I guess I prefer these annoying guys to the lower enemies because they actually do have memorable designs. And it's a cool detail how they look shriveled up in Kanehurst since they have no food, and then in Hunter's Nightmare they're fat since they have plenty to eat. But overall, when I think of them, I mostly just think of how annoying and spammy they are. Their jumping animation is kind of funny, though. Number 52, Celestial Larvae. Out of all the enemies I've mentioned so far, these are definitely the biggest pushovers. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that I've never actually been hit by one of them before. But what they lack in being formidable, they make up for by being interesting. As far as I know, we really don't know much about these things, but considering the area they're found in, and the fact that they all seem focused on looking in Ebrietus' direction, it's likely that they're related to her in some capacity, and they just do a good job of building the weird tension in Upper Cathedral. Number 51, Brain Suckers. While this is very low on the list, I'm sure people will still be upset that they're not lower. And admittedly, I really do hate fighting these things. They're just not fun. And their whole strategy revolves around finding methods to hold you still so they can do one of, if not the, most annoying grab attack in the entire series, which also drains two of your insight every time. But I do like how they're used in Upper Cathedral Ward. They help to make it the scariest area in the game, and their appearances early on is one of the first signs in the game that there might be cosmic forces behind the beastly scourge. Number 50, Research Hall Patients. These guys do have some cool lore associated with them, and they do a good job of showing you just how messed up the research halls become. Plus, the passive ones have a lot of genuinely intriguing dialogue. But... Gameplay-wise, fighting these things is about as fun as getting the Hunter's Mark branded on your ball sack. Luckily, they don't have that much poise, so once you stun lock them, you're good. But they do way too much damage, and have combos that last for days. So when you combine that with this one room of pain where there's genuinely, like, 20 of them, it's just a recipe for a shit time. Number 49, Skeletal Puppets. Combat-wise, I have very little to say about these guys. They just kind of creepily shift around like the puppets they are, who I assume are controlled by Mikolash, since once you force him out of the nightmare, they all just stop moving. The main thing I don't like is their placement in the first half of the fight. Like, it really just sucks and feels like bait so that he can hit you from the side, but all in all, it's not that bad. The main thing I do like is just the theories of what these things are. And my favorite is the idea that there are other members of the School of Mensis who entered the nightmare alongside Mikolash. Too bad they have nothing to wake up to, since, uh, you know. Number 48, Nightmare Apostles. I'm just including all the spider variations here. And honestly, I don't like fighting these things. They just have uninteresting spammy attacks, and the big one especially sucks. I hate that thing. But there's one really stupid reason why they made it this high. There's a version of them that have human heads, and they have bowl cuts. And for some reason, I just find that absolutely hilarious. It also kind of makes me think that these could be more members of the School of Mensis, who unfortunately got turned into spiders upon entering the nightmare. Number 47 is dogs with crow heads, and number 46 is crows with dog heads. You know what? This was actually a funny idea. If there's one thing we know that FromSoft is completely aware of, it's what specific things in their games that the players hate. And yep, they just took two of the most annoying enemies in the game and combined them. Luckily, there aren't too many of them, and it's pretty easy to sneak up on them, so in reality, they're not that bad, and I can just safely appreciate the devs having an inside joke. Number 45, Silver Ladies. So these enemies made it this high because they actually work decently well. Their attacks are quick but not too spammy, they have cool ghostly designs, and a decent amount of health. So you'd think this would make them good enemies, right? Well, they could have been if they weren't so damn annoying. Like, I just want to appreciate how awesome this cool gothic castle looks. Why do you have to loudly cry and scream the entire time I'm here? I'm sure they have a tragic backstory of being killed off by the church and whatnot, but you know what? I don't care. Their backstory could have the combined tragedy of Guts, Kratos, and like an Aaron, Batman, Sasuke sandwich, and I still wouldn't care. Number 44, Crawlers and Large Crawlers. Considering that these things mostly just chill in poison pools, I don't imagine many players go out of their way to fight them, myself included actually. So why do I kind of like them? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, I just genuinely think they look cool and insane. When they lift themselves up and show you their underside, you can see a bunch of messengers attached to them, which is horrifying. But also, they look incredibly similar to Mother Koss. Some say Cosm. And one of my favorite background details in this game is how from the Nightmare Frontier, you can see ship masts below, which highly resemble the wrecked ships in Fishing Hamlet, which happens to be where Koss is located. 
meaning these things are more closely connected than they may seem. So I just can't help but be intrigued by their connection to costs, whatever it may be. Number 43, Rifle Yarnamites. So now that we're onto a FromSoft game that isn't Sekiro, ranged enemies no longer have the cool benefit of giving you deflectable shots. And because of that, there's really not too much to say about them. I don't dislike them or anything, but their role is really simple. They try to take you out from a distance while you're busy fighting melee dudes, and once you get close, they're pushovers. Though I guess I like how they push you to take them out first, so it's less of a handful to deal with nearby foes. And the fact that they're guaranteed to drop bullets is nice. Number 42, Chime Maidens. The Maidens just represent the gimmick of continuously respawning dead enemies until you kill them, and it's okay, I guess. It's not a particularly great idea, but the execution isn't necessarily bad. Also, I love hitting them with a the Shaman Bone Blade and then seeing them just get killed by their own minions. Number 41, Cramped Caskets. These were definitely some of the hardest enemies to rank. I do think they look pretty cool, and it's pretty messed up to know that they're made from the victims of the Mensis ritual, but actually fighting them is pretty hit or miss. On their own, they're attacks are fine, a bit spammy for sure, but nothing too annoying, and they have some weird projectiles, but once you fight them in groups, it just becomes a shit show. I haven't discussed ganks nearly as much in this video compared to the last one, because overall, fighting multiple enemies in Bloodborne isn't as much of a hassle as it is in Sekiro, but these guys are a strong exception. Dealing with more than one at a time just doesn't feel fair. Number 40, Slime Scholars. I guess you could argue for these guys to be lower. They're not the most fun to fight, and they have some kind of annoying projectiles dials, but I don't know, I just like them. I always found it amusing to see a bunch of them chilling in their seats waiting for a lecture, even though it probably ain't happening, and it's just kinda intriguing to wonder what happened to them. So yeah, not really much to say about them, very average middle of the road enemies. Number 39, Eye Collectors. These enemies are basically just reskin Witches of Hemwick, and they mostly only appear in the High Persian Jail area. Unlike the witches, they don't have any spells, their only real notable attack is just their grab where they try to steal your eyes. But overall, they're okay. And they have easily the funniest death sound effect in the entire game. <coughs> Number 38, Snake Balls. The main thing that elevates these enemies is just the cool twist of the second half of Forbidden Woods becoming a snake-themed area. And while I like the whole snake theme, these guys are easily the least cool out of the snake enemies. Like, they're not bad, but they mostly just nip at your feet while you're busy fighting the more important foes. Number 37, Celestial Emissaries. The main thing that makes these guys stand out is, of course, their placement in Forbidden Woods. For a lot of players, myself included, this was one of the weirdest moments in my first playthrough. Pretty much all the enemies up until this point have been beasts or just strange creatures, but then these alien dudes show up and it makes you start to wonder what's really going on throughout Yarna. Combat-wise, the melee ones are pretty basic, but the spellcasters are actually surprisingly deadly. They still die pretty quick, though. Number 36, Snail Women. Similar to the Celestial Emissaries, the Snail Women are mostly commendable for building the game's atmosphere in a cool way. I like how one just randomly drops from the sky in Hunter's Nightmare, indicating that the fishing hamlet is somewhere above you. Man, nightmare geography is so weird. And then of course, once you get to the Hamlet Cave, they're all over the place, and they also make you realize that those things beneath your feet aren't fish gross. Then of course, there's the ominous scene of them praying before the corpse of Koss and her orphan, which is really cool. They're not particularly fun to fight, but I can't ignore what a fantastic job they do at setting the mood for the DLC's finale. Number 35, Hemwick Grave Women. The Hemwick Grave Women are like a less memorable version of the Yarnamites, but they also make Hemwick feel more like a unique location, even if it is one of the less noteworthy areas in the game. Like the Yarnamites, it's fun to hear them spout dialogue about killing you and how much you disgust them since they're so far gone. They also have some memorable sneaky placements, and moveset-wise, they're pretty solid. I don't really have any complaints. Number 34, Garden of Eyes. First of all, I apologize to the guy on YouTube named after these enemies for putting you in the bottom half of the list, but in general, I like these guys. Their attacks aren't crazy good, and they have one grab where they give you frenzy, which is pretty uncool. But I like their placement in the game. Being found at Bergenworth, there's a good chance that the reason they have so many eyes was because of them being experimented on by Bergenworth scholars to see if physically adding eyes would be a reasonable way to ascend as great ones. Unfortunately though, it seems they were wrong. Number 33, Kanehurst Gargoyles. After dealing with the annoying ass screeching silver ladies inside of Kanehurst, it feels like a nice breath of fresh air when you get to the top and just face off against these gargoyles. They're not particularly amazing either, but still a good bit better. In a few areas, they try to pass as just being statues, but once you get close, they start moving, and I think that's a cool gimmick. There's also a few spots where they're hidden and try to get the jump on you. They do have an annoying grab attack as well, but honestly, that goes for a lot of enemies. Number 32, Winter Lanterns. Okay, so ranking Winter Lanterns is really weird. 
You know how in the intro, I said this list would be subjective, since it's hard to measure an enemy when they're super cool lore and design-wise, but suck gameplay-wise? Well, Winter Lanterns are like a 10 out of 10 on the cool factor scale, while also being a 10 out of 10 on the bullshit scale. When it comes to fighting them, you literally build frenzy just by looking at them, and when the frenzy meter is full, you lose 75% of your max HP. So combining this with the fact that their only attack is a grab with insane range, which leaves you unable to deal with your frenzy, it's basically a perfect recipe for one-shotting you. But on the other hand, these things are so damn interesting. I love their insane humming slash singing slash whatever the hell it is. And it's really cool that if you use the make contact gesture, they completely stop in their tracks, which is so ominous. And the lore around them is so insane. Upon close inspection, they share a lot of similarities to the doll, and a lot of people believe that they're just what happens to the dolls after they've been used to level up too many times. There's also the fact that they commonly drop high-level blood gems for you, which makes farming them in the late game a good tactic. So overall, you can place these enemies a lot higher or a lot lower, and I wouldn't really be able to argue. Gameplay-wise, they're complete ass, but I can't help but be intrigued by them. Number 31, Beast Patience. So from here on, I'm starting to have very few negative things to say about the enemies. Though of course, there will be exceptions. And the Beast Patients make it here mostly just for being solid and inoffensive enemies. They don't have crazy movesets or anything, but they work well as the main enemy type in Old Yarnum, And they're mostly just a threat because they attack in large numbers. Also, it's cool how they're some of the first beasts to ever exist, since they're basically the first wave of people who are turned into beasts, leading Old Yarnum to be burned down. And also leading them to be afraid of fire, meaning they'll act somewhat passive around you if you're holding a torch, which is nice. Number 30, Cloaked Beast Patients. And they're one spot higher since they serve the same purpose as the regular Beast Patients, except they look slightly cooler, and have slightly more dangerous movesets. I'm also including the giant cloaked ones here, since I don't want it to be too redundant. And they're also slightly more dangerous, and have slightly better movesets, plus they're more intimidating due to their size. Number 29, Giant Lost Children. Okay, for these guys, I really didn't know what to put for their names. Some call them yetis, others just say rock throwers, but I'm going with what seems to be the official name for them. And by far, the best thing about these guys is their goofy-ass faces. Like, I'm sorry, but I can't help but at least smile every time I see one of these things. They just look so weird, and I love it. Other than that, they throw giant rocks at you, which then break into smaller pieces of rock when landing, which also do a ton of damage, so basically, don't get hit by it. Up close, they aren't helpless, but they're not exactly intimidating either, so while they're not super special gameplay-wise, I'll always just have a weird soft spot for them. Number 28, Fluorescent Flower. This is basically the epitome of how high an enemy can be placed by design alone. Well, mostly. It does have one really cool attack from range where it shoots many meteors summoned from the cosmos, which is awesome. But other than that, this thing isn't very remarkable in terms of combat. Even so, I just find this thing to be memorable. Its anatomy is really bizarre, and I like its placement at Bergenworth. I haven't really found much lore on this thing, but the fact that it's in this area just makes sense. Number 27, Fishman Mages. So now we have some more projectile-based enemies, but these ones are actually pretty cool. They basically just smite down lightning on wherever you're standing, so as long as you keep moving, they're not too difficult. Though, going down a ladder near one is basically a guarantee to get hit. Overall, they do a good job of building the weird atmosphere in the second half of Fishing Hamlet. And also, who could forget the ranting one at the beginning of the area? Black and white. Last one must be murderous. blood crazed fiends. Atonement for the wretches by the wrath of Mother Goss. Number 26, Mergo's Attendants and Chief Attendants. These guys are some of the most bizarre enemies in the entire series, and I just can't help but find them memorable. Sometimes they just work like zombie pigmen. They'll leave you alone, but if you start attacking them, they'll fight back. But other times, they also just attack you anyway when your back is turned to them. In general though, being surrounded by them is amusing. It kind of reminds me of watching the mushroom people walk around in Dark Souls 1. Then there's also the big female versions who attack you regardless. They have decent movesets and aren't really a pain to fight, so I think they're cool. Also, if they're near the basic ones, then they'll start attacking you as well. Overall, very odd enemies. Number 25, Amygdalas or Amygdalae. I don't know how to pronounce their plural version. Anyway, lots of you probably don't consider these things to be enemies. And that's fair, since they aren't killable aside from the one that's a boss fight. I guess that could rule them out. But 
I just had to include them. Bloodborne wouldn't be the same without these things. In fact, I think they're possibly the most well-done aspects of the entire game in terms of getting across the Lovecraftian twist. In the early game, it's very unclear what they even are. There are just some spots in the game where you'll find that a weird blue vortex wants to suck you up. And if you get caught, there's some weird invisible thing that crushes and teleports you. But if you do one of two things, either defeat Rom and cause the Blood Moon's descent, or gain at least 40 insight, you can see them. And that was easily one of the best moments in my entire first playthrough. Like, you mean that giant Rule 34 looking piece of shit up there has just been around this whole time? And then it's great how they're just all over the place in Yahar Ghoul. By this point in the game, you really just have to accept that there are immensely powerful beings at work in the world, and you just have to be fine with their existence. Also, I have to mention their designs. They wouldn't be nearly as effective if they just had some boring, generic look to them, but my god, these things look awesome. Number 24, Brain of Mensis. And Brain of Mensis is here since I like it for similar reasons as the Amygdala. Gameplay-wise, it isn't special, it just forces frenzy on you from a distance, but luckily you can usually just run past that spot pretty quickly anyway. The main reason I love this thing is just lore and general weirdness. Many people think of it as the final evolution of the dolls. First they turn into winter lanterns, and then eventually just this. Pretty shitty life cycle. But the best thing about the brain is that it has one of my favorite moments in the game. Once you drop it into the pit, you can actually get close to it, and if you attempt to make contact with it... it will give you a moon rune. Now, I've heard many theories for why it does this, but here are my two favorites. Since it is confirmed that this thing is a great one, it probably knows of the existence of other great ones. So when it gives you the moon rune, that might be its way of trying to warn you about the moon presence. And the other theory would be that, since the moon rune gives you more echoes from killing enemies, that might be its way of telling you to kill it, so that it can leave this realm or dimension or whatever, and go on to do whatever it is great ones do, I guess. Number 23, Yarnamites. I know it's a bit debatable to put them this high, since on their own, these guys aren't that formidable, but the game just wouldn't be the same without them. They're such a memorable part of the first half especially. And I love how at first it's kind of confusing why you're just slicing up the supposed common folk of the city. Until you realize it's because they're turning into beasts, and they're just only partially transformed by this point. Overall, I really enjoy these guys. They're way more memorable than, say, the basic hollow enemies in Dark Souls. And of course, their quotes. Number 22, Wheelchair Huntsmen. These guys serve a similar purpose to the regular Yarnamites, but are just more memorable. Seeing these elders give their best effort to try and put you down is really entertaining. Plus, they actually end up having a lot of variants with different weapons that were really surprising at first. Some of them literally have full-on Gatling guns, and there are also ones who have flamethrowers. I just love seeing these old dudes busting out all these crazy tools. And it's hilarious how you can just stand right in front of the blunderbuss ones and their shots will miss. Number 21, NPCs. So, this is kind of a weird one. I imagine a lot of people expected them to be way lower on the list, but at the end of the day, I guess this is where I'd put them as a collective whole. The dilemma with these guys is that fighting them can range anywhere between, wow, that was surprisingly fun, to holy shit, why am I even playing this game? All in all, it really is just like facing other players using different trick weapons. So overall, I don't dislike their inclusion in the game, but they probably would have been better if A, there were never more than one at a time, and B, they had significantly less health. If they just fine-tuned these guys a bit more, they low-key could have been top-tier enemies. Number 20, Kanehurst Servants. Man, I wish these guys had more health, because they're easily the best out of the Kanehurst enemies. I mean, the ones with canes are okay, and I don't really like the ones who use blow darts. But the ones with rapiers are actually pretty fun. If you go out of your way to use a weak weapon against them, dodging their stabs and coming into hit is kind of satisfying. But as I said, they really just don't have much health. If they had a bit more along with some additional varied attacks, they might have been really cool. Number 19, Big Snake Balls. While the small snake balls do a good job at portraying the snake twist in Forbidden Woods, they don't really have much substance to them. But luckily, the big ones are actually pretty interesting enemies. And the fact that they're bigger makes for a really intimidating and cool design. Unfortunately, dealing with them is actually pretty simple though. They may seem scary at first, but hilariously, if you could just get behind them, they're pretty helpless since it takes them a good minute to turn around. But still, it's fun to do so. Other than that, the only flaw I could think of is that they deal poison, but at least it makes sense due to them being snakes. 
Number 18, Mad Ones. Obviously the most notable thing about these guys is how they work based on insight. If you come to Hemwick with less than 15 insight, then they just aren't even summoned, which is cool, and a slight nod to the importance of insight early on in the game. Overall, I think these guys have cool designs and a pretty fast and visceral, yet fair moveset. Though I will say they do really suck in group fights. However, they usually don't appear near too many enemies, so it's not a huge deal. Number 17, Maneater Boars. As probably one of the most memorable enemy types in the series, I think a lot of us have a soft spot for the giant pig. When it comes to combat, they're not particularly noteworthy. Most of their attacks are pretty basic, except for their charge, which does absolutely nutty damage. But they're a nice guarantee for getting some blood vials, and the late game ones are also part of the best soul farm in the main game. That is, if you're comfortable looking at them. And of course... I... I have no words. A lot of people think this animation was just an unfortunate circumstance from the nature of backstabs, but something tells me FromSoft knew what they were doing. Number 16, Hamlet Fishman. The best thing about these guys is how fitting they are with their area. Like, imagine if you found yourself in this weird, creepy fishing village, but the main enemies inhabiting it were just regular Yarnamites. That would be such a mood killer. But luckily, these guys fit perfectly. I guess you could say the same for the research hall patients, but... No. In terms of combat, they're definitely some of the better flowing fodder enemies, and the weapons they use such as harpoons feel perfectly fitting. They also have some long-ish wind-up attacks that are very satisfying to parry. Overall, these guys serve their purpose well with minimal flaws, except I absolutely hate this one guy who tries to bait you into getting stomped by the first shark enemy. Number 15 is the Nightmare Executioner with the cannon. Overall, I really like the Nightmare Executioners, and as an enemy by itself, this guy isn't bad at all. However, the reason why he can't be any higher is because of the terrible duo fight he creates with one of the axe executioners. Luckily, you can spawn behind him with a certain lamp, and just fight the cannon guy on his own first, which is nice, but because of the way it's set up, I'm sure a lot of people attempted to fight one, said screw this when the other one joined, and then never fought them again. Which is a shame, because on their own, they're actually really good enemies, and I'm just gonna blame the whole situation on this cannon guy. But aside from all the bullshittery, he's still a really fun enemy to fight solo. His attacks are kind of slow, but still aggressive with a nice and deliberate pace. If it weren't for the shaky enemy placements, this guy definitely would have been higher. Number 14, Brick Trolls. These guys are great at being one of the first enemies in the game that you actually have to take seriously. Up until the first encounter with one, pretty much all you've fought until that point is regular Yarnamites, so I really appreciate them for creating some of the more tense moments in the game's opening hour. And for anyone who's playing Bloodborne as their first FromSoft game, they're a serious wake-up call in letting you know that not all enemies will be easily staggered, which should transition into realizing you should parry them. To this day, it's hard to recall a recent time that I fought one of these guys and didn't parry them, and that's probably because of how well they ingrained that aspect of the combat into me. See an enemy with lots of health and poise, then take a chance at deleting a huge chunk of their health. The only thing I don't really like about them is their design. I mean, it's not bad, but compared to other creatures in Bloodborne, they are pretty bland. Number 13, Wolf Yarnamites. These guys are kind of similar to the Brick Trolls, but I just find them more memorable. Personally, these enemies were the way that I figured out what the hell was going on with the Yarnamites on my first playthrough, since they're basically just a version of them that's more fully transformed into a beast. Plus, I just think they look cool, and a lot more intimidating than the Brick Trolls. And similar to them, these guys are another early part of the game that should engrave into you just how helpful parrying is. And once again, that's almost always how I deal with them. Number 12, Executioners. I really wish these guys were utilized better. There's only a handful of them in the entire game, and they're mostly just found in pretty uninteresting sections. But as enemies, I think they're quite good. Despite being pretty big boys, their attacks can come out surprisingly fast. And they hit pretty hard for the early game, so once again, these enemies are prime targets for gun parries. Though it is notably harder to do so here compared to the Brick Trolls and Wolf Yarnamites, since they can be surprisingly deceptive about when their attacks actually come out. Number 11, Snatchers. These guys are insanely memorable. I remember when I first encountered one, I was genuinely wondering if the game was bugged, because they seem to have way too much health and hit way too hard. But nope, these guys are just built different. And obviously the main reason why they hit so hard is because the devs wanted to ensure that you'll die to them at least once. Because if you do, then they drag you away and you get to discover Yahar Ghoul early in the game, which was one of the most memorable moments on my first playthrough. And other than that whole aspect, I actually really like fighting them. I could see people argue that they're poorly designed since, at the end of the day, their main standout feature is basically the fact that they're unbalanced, and can kill you damn near instantly. But after playing this game countless times, I like having an enemy that genuinely 
keeps me on the edge of my seat and forces me to think twice before attacking. And of course, parrying works really well for that. Number 10, Beast Possessed Soul. Similar to the fluorescent flower, there's only one of this enemy type in the entire main game. They're mostly found elsewhere in Chalice Dungeons, which is a shame because if there were more of these guys, then they'd be a good bit higher. Their design is badass and fighting them is genuinely really fun. They have such a tense and fast paced moveset combined with some awesome pyromancy attacks. And if they transform into their second mode, God, it just looks so cool. Fighting this thing really gets me in that mood where I feel like I'm in a badass brawl between Hunter and Beast. Like I said, the only thing holding it back is just the lack of them outside the Chalice Dungeons, meaning they can't leave too much of an impact outside of the one fight. But aside from that, I pretty much like everything about these guys. Number 9, Church Doctors. While these guys aren't as cool on their own as one individual beast-possessed soul, they make up for it by being a lot more memorable. They're basically the main enemy of Cathedral Ward, which is basically the main area of the first half of the game. So it's nice that there's also a lot of variations of them. Them. There's guys with canes, scythes, repeating pistols, flame sprayers, and giant frenzy poking sticks. However, the most notable thing about them is obviously their parry window. I said before that brick trolls and wolf yarnamites act kind of like a parrying tutorial, but these guys are a literal parry tutorial, because if you shoot at any moment in their attack animation, you get a guaranteed stun. And while it does somewhat trivialize them, I'm okay with it since they're usually found in groups, which makes things a bit more tense. And one more neat touch is how when you progress through the game and get more insight, the ones who carry lamps start being able to use new attacks with them, which is a cool feature and kind of throws you off the first time. Also, I really like their designs. They're basically just a bunch of ghost face clones, but with way better drip. Number 8, Shark Giants. I can already see the people in the comments talking about how shit these enemies are, but I've had it with all the shit people give these guys, because they're awesome. They do have flaws, and I'll cover that soon, but overall I think they're great. Sometimes you need to have these bigger and beefier enemies that you're meant to completely focus on, which is helped by the fact that they're really damn intimidating. And overall I'd say they're pretty well designed. Most of their attacks are slow and easy to predict, but they also come with some huge delays, which can be really deceptive. And when you can consistently parry them, it feels amazing, since there's almost no chance you're gonna break their stagger otherwise. In my opinion, they only have two flaws. One is obviously the well where there's two of them, because no and the other would be their charge attacks. Most of the time when fighting these guys, I find it enjoyable and challenging, but once they use that charge, my patience just evaporates. The hitbox is just too damn long and humongous. But other than that, I really appreciate these guys for giving the game a good challenge outside of boss fights, and fitting well with their area. Number 7, Scourge Beasts. In my opinion, these might be the most solid enemies in the entire game. They're found throughout a lot of sections, and they even come with a disgusting redesign in Yahar Ghoul, where they're made out of various body parts. The main reason I think they work well well is because despite them being fast, having a lot of health, and doing decent damage, it's pretty easy to stunlock them. This is also nice because it makes dealing with them in ganks less of a headache, and when it comes to their attacks, most of them are pretty well telegraphed, so they never really feel cheap to me. They're also used for multiple jump scares throughout the game, which is really unlike these games to do, making it stand out. So overall I think they're kind of underappreciated. Also, since they can easily be staggered, it's really fun to spam the World of Gig L2 on them. Number 6, Shadows of Yarnum. I'm sure the shadows have a fair share of haters, just due to the nature of them being reused from a boss fight. But honestly, I think these guys might even work better as enemies than their initial boss fight. I can't think of any enemy types that feel more specifically catered towards group fights than these guys. The way they're balanced with melee dudes, pyromancer dudes, and ones who are partially both just works really well. Fighting the melee ones straight up is a lot of fun. They have some quick and visceral sword swipes that are insanely fun to parry, and the other two types are sort of pushovers on their own, but do a good job of keeping pressure on from range, and all the while not being too annoying. And I personally have fun baiting them to hit me so I can just parry them as well. Plus, I just think they look cool, and it's interesting how they work as guardians of Queen Yarnum since they're Thumerians. Also, like the giant pigs, they're part of the best soul farm in the main game, and I always love pitting them against the pigs to see who comes out on top. Number 5, Lauren Silver Beasts. When I started making a rough draft of this list, I had these guys somewhere around the middle, because I very rarely actually fought them, and mostly just had messy memories of dealing with them near the Mensis Brain's frenzy, which would usually just result in me running past them. But upon closer inspection, these guys are kind of awesome. I can't recall any enemy from any of these games having so many different methods of attacking you. These guys wave torches, try to bite you, instantly grow super long claws, sling worms at you, shoot whatever this is, use the torch as a flamethrower, cause a lightning blast, or just say screw all that and get on all fours to charge at you. They're so insane and I love it. Plus they work really well as a nightmare enemy type. They just look like such illogical abominations and they fit perfectly. So all in all I surprisingly really like the silver beasts now. 
Number 4, Chapel Giants. Easily one of the coolest looking enemies in my opinion. Seeing these giant skelly boys slowly patrolling the streets makes the vibe at Cathedral Ward a lot more tense than if it was just the church doctors. And all in all, I think they're damn well designed. As you would expect, they have slow but hard-hitting attacks, and this is one of the few enemies where I'd maybe recommend not locking on, since sometimes it feels easier to roll through their attacks than dash by them. They also have a completely unique mechanic where if they do a slam attack, they can shoot a bone through their knee, and if you hit it enough, it will get them into a staggered state, and I don't think I can recall any other enemies from these games having a feature like that. There's also a few different variations of them, but honestly the axe ones are probably just the best. The barehanded ones are kinda easy, and the fire fist one is actually pretty cool, but the one with the ball and chain next to the bloodstone shards... I don't know about that one. The placement is just so cruel. Number 3, Snake Parasites. Now we have the best of the snake enemies. And not only are they easily the best of them in terms of combat, but they also do the best job at portraying the twist. I like how when you see the first one, you kinda just assume that it's another random Yarnamite enemy. But then this happens. Oh! Well that's neat. And luckily, they're actually pretty fun to fight. I like how they have a mixture of attacks with the snakes themselves, meanwhile the body still tries to hit you. And since the snake bites can be really quick and hard to predict, pairing them takes a lot of time to get used to. But when you do pull it off, it feels great. I think there's just the right amount of them placed throughout the Forbidden Woods, and I don't have any issues aside from the poison. But like I said with the big snake balls, at least it makes sense. Number 2, Nightmare Executioners. I know how controversial it will be to put these guys at number 2. There are so many different reasons for people to dislike them. There's the terrible duo with the cannon guy that I mentioned earlier, and the only other one is found in an annoyingly tight spot, which doesn't really work for fighting such a large enemy. Plus, that one perfectly blocks your path to get to the Lawrence boss fight. And even when considering all that, it's arguable that they aren't even good as single target enemies, because they have easily the most demanding moveset in the entire game. Their first phase isn't too overwhelming, but once they gain that AoE buff, you basically have to be perfect. If you get staggered at the beginning of a combo, then that's it. You're just done. But despite all that going against them, personally, there's just no way I could have put them lower than number two. Sure, their second phase is super demanding, but it's also damn fun. All throughout, these guys have such a quick and visceral moveset, and dodging them to get hits in is an absolute joy. While their AoEs are debatably a bit too much, I love the fact that they force you to think about where you're dodging, and not just mindlessly iframe. I think these guys really are the most fun you can have with the game's combat outside of boss fights. Plus, for the hundredth time in this video, I gotta mention how cool they are. I love how their design is like a mixture between weird Cthulhu monsters and genuinely badass intimidating fighters. Also, this attack exists. Hey! Hey, I've seen this one! And I think their buff in Phase 2 looks and sounds awesome. These guys are top tier in my book, but I think most of you knew going into this what would be number one. Number one, Old Hunters. Before I began ranking the enemies, and before I even knew I would be making this video, I already knew without a shadow of a doubt that the old hunters are my favorite enemies in Bloodborne. Imagine if you took the idea of hunter NPCs, tweaked them to be a bit less spammy, and gave their moveset a more deliberate and fair pace, while also just making them ten times cooler. These enemies are such a fantastic, memorable, and downright brilliant introduction to the DLC. Since the hunter's nightmares where blood-drunk hunters are forced to spend their lives just endlessly killing beasts, you'd think it could make them depressed, but nah, they downright revel in this shit. Watching them kill beasts is so entertaining. And there's quite a few variants of them. I love that they're also basically an advertisement for the new weapons in the DLC, like, damn, that's cool. I want to try it now. But of course, this would all be a waste if they weren't actually fun to fight. Luckily though, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys is an absolute pleasure. They're just fast and punishing enough to make you take them seriously, but they're also not too spammy to where it gets annoying. Personally, my favorites are definitely the ones with boom hammers. They're just the most chaotic and memorable to me. The ones with beast cutters aren't too far behind though. They're some of the most fun enemies to parry in the game. If I were to have one complaint, it would be that some of the ones with beast hunter safes don't have a whole lot of health, but overall that's a pretty minor flaw. And like I said before, I think the nightmare executioners have the actual highest highs in terms of combat, but these guys are just a lot more clean, and they have all the other things I mentioned going for them. So unsurprisingly, I believe the old hunters are the crowning achievement of Bloodborne's enemies. Alright, another enemy ranking done. Honestly, I was pretty shocked that you guys enjoyed the Sekiro one so much, since I figured I was in the minority for actually caring about enemy design to such an extent, but I'm glad that people are interested in it. I'm sorry this video took so long to come out, as dealing with the end of my college semester really took a toll on my free time, but now I'm back and more motivated than ever to make videos. 
Also, just for the record, you'll never have to assume that I've ditched my channel. I know it isn't much yet, but I'm super appreciative of how far it's come, so thanks to all of you for actually watching my content. As far as the enemy rankings go, I still plan to do more, but to be honest, they're really draining, so I think I'm always gonna have at least one video in between them. Oh yeah, and before anything else, I said in the intro that I'd explain why I didn't include the Chalice Dungeon exclusives. Honestly, I just don't have the most experience with the Chalice Dungeons. Like, I do utilize them every now and then, but overall they're not really my cup of tea, so having to get familiar with all of them would have made this video take a significantly longer time to make. But hey, maybe Rusty will do it at some point. He also seems to like making Redundant Souls videos. Now, for my next video, I gotta be honest, playing Bloodborne to make this video has gotten me fully back into Bloodborne mode, and there's a very good chance my next video will be like, top 10 Bloodborne weapons. Or not. We'll see. Anyway, see ya.